I was at Stanford University working with uh, students in a uh, satellite program, but the concept that we were using at that point was micro satellites. These were satellites about the size of a lady's large hat box. And um, I had an opportunity to work with some people at the Aerospace Corporation in um, uh, down in Southern California. And what they actually wanted to do was to launch little Pico satellites. They had the idea of maybe something in the future would come about with these little Pico satellites. And the Pico satellites at that time were about the size of a, a Klondike ice cream bar. And so at Stanford with the students in one of our micro satellites, we actually built a launcher that would hold these Pico satellites. And uh, it had four chambers on it. And the idea was when the micro satellite got up into space, then we would send it commands to release the Pico satellites. And we actually used the uh, large um, antenna at Stanford University to communicate with the, um, with the little Pico satellites. It was an experiment that Aerospace Corporation wanted. Well, after having done this, and, and it turned out to be a fairly successful uh, experiment, we got the PicoSats launched, they got them tested. And, and, but I was having problem with the students in getting them to finish their microsatellites. There was a lot of room in them and, and they kept adding things to them. And, and so <clears throat> I thought after having launched these little Pico satellites, uh, of course they were flat and they had solar panels on one side, but no attitude control on them. So, you know, if they face the sun, you generated power. If they didn't face the sun, you didn't generate power. So I got to thinking about, well, I wonder if I can make something like this Pico satellite, but not being stabilized, how do I get power no matter which way it's turning? And so that come up with the idea of a cube. And so I got to looking around for cube sizes and went to the, to the local uh, plastic store and found a, a four inch cube that I thought, well, this is just about right. It's about the size of these PicoSats that we launched. And, and at that time there was kind of the craze of putting Beanie Babies in them. So the Beanie Baby box. So I took that and uh, from the experience that we'd had with the Pico satellites, I come up with a standard on that. And it was interesting because it was a four inch box, but if you know the standard on the CubeSat is a is a 10 inch or 10 centimeter cube. And um, I, about that time, uh, NASA had a, a problem of mix up in uh, dimensions and uh, standards uh, between a couple of companies and a project they had. And I thought, well, maybe it's because the aerospace industry is typically um, the metric system. Why don't we make this thing a metric? And so I, I changed the dimensions on it when I do the drawings on it. Uh, from ten uh, from um, a four inch cube to a ten centimeter cube, and that was kind of good because the definition for a a pico satellite was one kilogram. Well, if you have a ten centimeter cube and you you uh, fill it with water, it's one kilogram. So it's just kind of some nice dimensions, and so that's that's where it went. And then also we needed a launcher for it. So what I did is uh, from the experience I'd had with a pico sat, I come up with a a launcher that could hold three of these um, uh, cube sats and uh, some rails along all four corners of them. And we didn't do anything in it to tighten it down so that they were rigidly held in there. There was, you know, a few millimeter, a few centimeters, or not centimeters, but really a micrometer tolerance in them. And the idea was, well, you put them in, there's a spring that holds them at one end that would push them out you close the door and then you tighten the spring up. And my feeling was if these things vibrated, they couldn't move very far. So, you know, it, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be bad. So that's, that's where the concept come from. And then I worked with uh, Jordi Pusari at Cal Poly and they were a, a good group in taking, uh, uh, taking ideas and, and making them practical. So Jordi and, and his students, you know, come up with the, the standard for it and, and actually use the same concept that I had for the launcher. And so we, we announced this and actually got our first launch of the, uh, 
uh, of the CubeSats on a Russian launcher in 2003. And the idea for me wanting this small satellite was the fact that I wanted the students to complete the satellite quicker than we were doing on the, the micro satellites. If they couldn't put much in it, then this was a this was a good thing. Maybe we could get it done quicker. So that's that was really where the concept come about. It was to limit students in the amount that they could put in the in the satellites and get them done quicker. You know, that's interesting because at the time I went to the uh, the office, the research office at Stanford and said, hey, I, I got this little thing. Uh, should we patent it? And they looked at it and they said, you know, well, it'll cost us twenty five or thirty thousand dollars to patent it. You know, I, I don't think this thing is worth it. You're just using it for educational purposes. And in fact, when I was working on it with Cal Poly, you know, Stanford is, you know, they're pretty prestigious university. And uh, when I was working with Cal Poly, the department chairman, George Springer, said, found out about it. And he said, you know, you, you don't need to work with Cal Poly. He said, we can do enough here on our own. So being a good faculty member, I went ahead and worked with Cal Poly. He <laughs> got, got the thing going. And, uh, and Patton and, and Stanford didn't want to patent it. They didn't want to do anything with it. But one of the interesting that turns out is the name CubeSat. We come up with the, it was called several other names before we got to CubeSat. But when we got to CubeSat, we started working with some people in Utah and they found out that we didn't have that name copyrighted. So they were going to go copyright the name CubeSat. <clears throat> and I talked to our patent department about that. I says, hey, how can these guys do that? They actually hired a, a, a patent attorney, a, to, a copyright attorney to uh, talk to the people in Utah and say, look, you, you guys don't have the right to do that. Uh, you know, you better back off on it. And they did. So that was the only thing that we got involved with patents and, and copyrights on it was that. And again, you know, we didn't have any idea of what the, what the, the use would be that we see today. So. You know, it's kind of funny. I, I, you know, if we'd have patented it and, and charged ten dollars a piece for all of them that launched, you know, it would have been some interesting money. But, but it wasn't. And you know, it, it's interesting. I wonder if it patented, if it would went where it did today. Does the patent limit it? You know, because open source is kind of a a motto today. Uh, it was open source the thing that perpetuated it more than being patented. It isn't necessarily the product itself. I think it's it's working on something and you know, people get excited about putting things in space. I think it's the confidence that the students build. That's that's the thing that I see. When students start on something like this, and typically <clears throat> they start building these satellites, and I'm I'm kind of standing back. I'm the hopefully the resource provider. I provide you know, the resources for them to do this and stand back. And in many cases, uh, quite frankly, they won't let me touch it. So, it, but it's the confidence they build and, and the, the technology that they have. The thing that I really always liked about satellites is the, is the broad scope of the technology. You know, it's got radios, it's got computers, it's got sensors, uh, processors, uh, this whole gamut of, of technology. And even though we put it into the satellite, it can apply to so many other things that I think that's where we're going to see the growth uh, from a lot of these students that have done that, not necessarily in the satellites itself, but I think in products that they'll use with the knowledge they got in building satellites. And that's the most exciting thing to me. I, you know, I've been in space. I got really excited about when we launched our first satellite, but, you know, now uh, you know, it's okay. I got my fingerprints in space because I, I I went in the rooms before we launched the satellite and put my fingers all over them so the, the students didn't know I'd done that. And that's how I got my fingerprints in space. I spent four years in the Air Force as a tech and then, then went to college on the GI Bill afterwards. And, and you know, the space program, you know, had started in... Uh, you know, the 50s, and 
one of the things that I remember is my wife and I were going, uh, I was at um, Moscow, Idaho, going on a, a, a car trip up to Seattle for something. And we listened on the radio and it was Alan Shepard's first suborbital flight. And I says, man, that is, that is so cool. I wonder if someday I'll ever be able to, you know, to work on the space programs. And, uh, and you know, it, it, quite frankly, it took me 20 years in the industry before I got back into education and got into the space program. But, you know, it, it, it's pretty fascinating. Uh, you know, we followed the space pra program so much when it went to the moon and, and but after the moon, then it you know it just it died off until the until the space shuttle come along. So I think that that it it's just a fun thing that it that attracts people. And and the only reason that I think that the CubeSat had started having the following it was it was a standard. It says hey, you know we didn't tell you what to put in this cube. You put whatever you want to in it. And then we provided a relatively safe way for them to get them launched because the, the, the large satellite makers didn't like these little satellites just hanging out in the open on the, on the vehicle when they launched in case they got away. So enclosing them in this, in this launch tube was a good thing. And I think that got a better acceptance because even with those, we couldn't get any U.S. launchers to launch them at all. It was an it was a number of years before we got on U.S. launchers. We had to go to the Russians to get them launched. To me, it's not so much the satellite itself. It's what people are starting to think about for the use of satellites. And I'm, a, I'm an old farm boy for Idaho, and I keep wondering, how, do these, how would these satellites benefit agriculture? Uh, is there anything that we could use the satellites and the, and the satellites, the only, the only purpose that they, they uh, provide in this is the communication. It's getting all of the data that you might need from, a, from an agricultural field or, or any other uh, agricultural product. How do you get all this data? How do you get it together and how do you make it useful to the farmer? And so I see it's very useful for that sort of thing. I think you know, looking at the, looking at the uh, environment, uh, seeing what we could do or couldn't, shouldn't do. I think that's where the, the real application. The other thing that I think is going to be very important, it's not so much with the satellites, it's more with the space station, but we'll move to satellites. And that's the effects of microgravity on various things. I think that we'll see a whole new line of materials and products and medicines that'll come about from uh, doing things in a microgravity environment because it's just entirely different than doing it on earth. So I think there'll be benefits, real benefits coming from space in the microgravity environment. And then I think there'll be a lot of benefits for us in the communications that we can do with the satellites on earth.